you got uh, <laughs> Psalm 
to the peace it will lie My name is Sean Ezekiel, President of the New South Wales Association of Sephardi and the Sephardi Synagogue. Thank you all for being here with us tonight to commemorate the Fahud, a program that took place in Iraq during World War II on the 1st and 2nd of June 1941, when hundreds of Jews were massacred. My association along with the New South Wales Jewish Board of Deputies, have come together to organize this commemoration. The Fahud came about as a result of Nazi propaganda inspired by the German ambassador, Dr. Fritz Grover, an anti-Semitic provocation by the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, Sheikh Haj Amin al Husseini, who had fled arrest in Palestine where he was wanted for inciting attacks on Jews and the British mandatory authorities. Tonight, I would like to welcome a few distinguished guests. William Nemesh, Councillor of Waverley Council and Community Relations and Board of Deputies. Dane Stern, Executive Member of Board of Deputies. David David, President of the Assyrian Australian National Federation. Mihamis Shaheen, Deputy Secretary of the Assyrian Universal Alliance. Albert Schlemon, representing the Assyrian Cultural and Social As Youth Association. Firaz Naim, President of the Iraqi Australian University Graduates Forum. Alfred Gabe, President of the Sephardi Federation of Australian Jewry. Tonight, we also mourn the sad, sudden passing of our generous donor, Susan Vakil. Condolences to the Vakil family, many of them who are here with us tonight. I'd like you all to put your hands together in appreciation of Dr. Kim Cunha's rendition of Psalm 137 by the Rivers of Babylon, with which we commence tonight's program. Its significance to tonight's program is that it marks the beginning of Jewish settlement in Babylon, today's Iraq, as captives after the conquest of Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar in 597 and 586 BC. Since that time, there has been a continuous and vibrant Jewish presence in the country until the middle of the 20th century, a community which effectively came to an end by early 1970s. Our program tonight highlights this long historical expanse and the demise of what had been the largest ethnic and religious community in Baghdad. And we end this evening's program with a screening of the documentary film, Remember Baghdad, which tells some of that history, but focuses particularly on a number of families who were among the last to leave Iraq, a land for which they had a real sense of love and attachment. In Psalm 137, we feel the bitterness of captives who were taken away from the beloved Jerusalem, but this bitterness did not last long. The prophet Jeremiah wrote to the captives in Babylon, urging them in God's name to build houses and live in them plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and become the fathers of sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters to husbands that they may bear sons and daughters and multiply there and do, do not decrease. Seek the well-being of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on his behalf for in its well-being he will have well-being. The captives heeded this message and adapted to life in Babylon while maintaining their religious distinctiveness. Indeed so, comfortable had they become. 
that in 538 BC, after the Persian King Cyrus the Great conquered Babylon and permitted the Jews to return to Jerusalem. A substantial proportion decided to stay on, becoming the forebearers of the community which had a continuous presence in the land. There is only a 70-year break in the historical record of Jews in Iraq. From 1401, when Tamerlane raised Baghdad to their ground, and the small numbers of survivors fled the city, trickling back when the situation became safe. In their long, last, long history in Iraq, the Jews, always a minority, had periods of comfortable living, of prosperity and acceptance but just as many periods when they were attacked and abused. Jews welcomed the Arab conquest in the 7th century as conditions had become harsh under Sassanid Persian rule. Under Islam, Jews became dhimmis, tolerated non-Muslims. The price of such toleration, a special tax called jizya, an acceptance of a status of permanent inferiority, abused by the majority Muslims, and the capricious whim of the ruler. Circumstances changed when the Mongol ruler, Argan Khan, conquered the land in 1284. A Buddhist who despised Islam, he preferred Jewish and Christian officials to appointed Jews Sa'ad al Dawla and his Grand Vizier. This caused bitter resentment among the majority Muslim population as seen in this bitter poem. Turned Jews for heaven itself had turned a Jew. This situation surely could not last, as the poor predicts. Yet wait, and you shall hear their torments cry, and see them fall and perish pres presently. After Argan Khan died and his sons were converted to Islam, the natural order was restored. That the Jewish and Christian officials were butchered. Muslims were again at the top and the dhimmis back in their subservient place. Early in the 20th century, while Iraq was still under Turkish rule, Jews benefited from constitutional reforms, which abolished dhimmitude and made them full citizens, a status that continued after World War I, when British ruled Iraq under a League of Nations mandate. Jews flourished and participated in all aspects of Iraqi society. They were prominent in such fields as music, law, commerce, medicine, and literature. And even in the Majlis, Iraq's parliament, Jews and Christians had eagerly embraced modern education more readily than did the Muslim majority. And they were keen to learn English and French. Consequently, they readily found work in national administration. This situation continued after Iraq's independence in 1932. However, Ambassador Groba and Sheikh al Husseini propaganda encouraged a coup, the Act, which brought a pro Nazi regime to power in Iraq in April 1941, causing the region Abd al Ilah to flee. Abd al-Ilah had ruled the country as regent while his nephew King Faisal II was still a child. The coup collapsed at the end of May after British troops wrested control of the country. Many soldiers and ordinary Iraqis, poisoned by anti-Semitic propaganda and linking the Jews' prosperity to their connection with the hated British, turned against their Jewish compatriots on 1st June 1941, and randomly slaughtered Jews who happened to be out in the streets. But they also broke into Jewish homes, indiscriminately killing any Jew they could get hold of, and looting their homes. When Abd el ilah forces entered Baghdad and restored order on the 2nd of June, hundreds of Jews had died, but so too had large numbers of the Jews' tormentors at the hands of the troops that had returned 
with the region. As we recall the Fahud, when many Iraqis turned against their Jewish countrymen, we must also acknowledge the many decent Iraqi Muslims had been prepared to stand up to protect the Jewish friends and neighbors and to give them shelter in their homes. Without their efforts, the loss of life, as bad as it was, would have been even more horrendous. Although order was restored and a semblance of normalcy had returned to Iraq, yet within 10 years of the Fahud, most Jews had left the country, their property confiscated, never to return to the land of their birth, the land of their forefathers. After the creation of the State of Israel in 1948, Jews were regarded as a fifth column supporting the Israeli enemy, even though many Iraqi Jews had not supported Zionism. Not to love the country where one's ancestors had lived for a hundred generations is surely impossible. But the wounds that Iraqi Jews have suffered have left to bitter estrangement from their homeland. As we view the film Remember Baghdad, we see yet again the Jews who chose to stay behind after the mass exodus in 1951 return to a life of apparent normalcy and prosperity, only to be shattered once more by mass hangings in 1969 on the pretext of spying for Israel. Unfortunately, the situation today remains poisonous, as we learn from the film Iraq's first beauty queen was Jewish last year. During the Miss World pageant, Miss Israel and Miss Iraq took a selfie together posted on Instagram as an expression on the shared hope for peace and friendship. The avalanche of threats to her life and angry comments in Iraqi media caused Miss Iraq and her family to flee the country. I long for the day when peace and friendship between Iraq and Israel, or at least between Iraq and Jews, whose roots go back there, I long for the day that Iraqi Jews can be welcomed back to safely visit places in the country which shaped their identity over hundreds of years. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. I now hand you over to our Master of Ceremonies, Dr. Maha Samra. The number of people who were uh, killed, the number of Jews who were killed during the Fahud is very unclear. The official uh, total is 178. Um, however, there are claims of as many as 900 people being murdered. Part of the reason for such a big discrepancy is the fact that the Jews weren't given their dead to bury. The people were buried together um, in a mass grave. Um, so who was buried, who was not, is not clear. And also, what happened to people is also not clear for other reasons. So there were, for instance, in, in one of the poems by uh, one of the Hapak brothers, he uh, refers to the possibility that maybe his two uncles who had disappeared, maybe they had gone to join the lost tribes. Who knows? There wasn't any proof that they had actually died in the Farhood. So people have, were left uncertain about the, the fate of their loved ones. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My friend, Dr. Cuniel, sang beautifully the psalm An Neharot Babel that depicts a people that were broken. They lost relatives and friends, brothers, sisters, wives, husbands, children and parents and grandparents. Al neharot Babel sham yashavnu gam bachinu bezochrenu et Zion. By the rivers of Babylon, we sat and we wept when we remember Zion. Ech nashir et shir Hashem. 
על אדמת נכר. A nation, thousands and thousands of people who have lost their crown, their jewel, the temple, their homeland in Israel. Wandering to a strange land, Babylon. What was their concern? Ech nashir et shir Hashem. How can we take with us the song of God? How can we find joy? How can we rebuild? Rebuild synagogues, houses of prayer, houses of worship. This was their concern. And indeed they were successful. Against their will, refugees from the land of Israel, they built <clears throat> an unparalleled Jewish community of which the Talmud comes from. Jewish scholarship reigned supreme in Babylon and sowed the seeds of custom, of tradition, of law throughout the diaspora of all Jewish communities. We're going to a strange land. How can we transplant everything that we have been taught? And they succeeded. Almost 2,000 years later, the Farhud. And I want people to understand that the Farhud should not be viewed in isolation. The Farhud, the seeds of animosity, of hatred, was sown by the Mufti of Jerusalem, of Yerushalayim, Hajamin al Husseini. These seeds was what eventually prompted the nations that belonged to the Arab League to cause <clears throat> the expulsion of Jews from all Arab lands. 850,000 Jews in total. And I can well imagine, and my own family, my own relatives were amongst them, <clears throat> who had to flee, who had to leave their country because of animosity, only able to take with them, leaving behind their wealth, only what they can carry with their hands. And I can well imagine that the exact opposite now happened. On the way back, the same rivers of Babylon, they sat and they wept, being refugees again. But this time, it was on the way back to Israel and Jerusalem, where a miracle happened. After the birth of the state of Israel, about half the population of the citizens of Israel are Jews from refu refugees of Arab lands, where they did the exact same thing, but in the opposite direction. They took with them everything that they built, their traditions, their songs, their strength of character and courage, and they planted this, these seeds everywhere where they went, particularly in the land of Israel, but all lands wherever they went. And this is a great tribute to the spirit of the Jewish people that are able to rebuild from the ashes. And tonight is on the one hand a commemoration of the atrocities, of not only of the Farhud, because the Farhud was the seeds of hatred that was sown that eventually brought about the expulsion of Jews from all Arab lands. But it is also a commemoration of the strength and a tribute to the Jewish people that were able to rebuild the communities where they were, where they ended up, be it in the land of Israel or in the diaspora. So on the one hand, we commemorate the memory of those that passed on and may their memory be a blessing and may their souls be bound in the bond of eternal life. But we also celebrate the courage of all those who continued life and rebuild their lives in the lands where they live. Thank you very much. Shila ma'alot esayinai leharim ma'ayin yavo ezri. Ezri mi'im Adonai osesh ha'mayim va'aretz. 
אל יתן למות רגליך אל ינום שומעך הנה לא ינום ולא ישן שומע לישראל אדוני שומעך אדוני צילך על יד ימיניך יומם השמש לא יכה כברך בלילה אדוני ישמורך מכל רע ישמור את נפשך אדוני ישמור צאתך ובואך מעתה ועד עולם גדל וקדש מרבה. אמן. ועלמא דיברה קורותיה ואמרית מלכותיה ועצמא פוקחני וקרא משיהא. אמן. בחי יכון וביום יכון וחי ידי כל בית ישראל בהלה ובזמן קריב וברוך. אמן. יהי שמי רבה מברך לעלם לעלמי עלמיה ויתברך וישתבה ויתפאר ויתרומם ויתנצי ויתדר ויתלה ויתלל שמי דקושה וריחו. לעילה מן כל ברכתה שירתה תשבעתה ונה המתה דאמירן ועלמא ואמרו אמן. יהי אשר אמר רבה משמיה חיים וסבא וישועה ונה אמה ועשה שפה ורפואה ועולה וסליחה וכפרה ורהוה ועצרה לנו ולכל עמו ישראל ואמרו אמן. עושה שלום ונאמרו הוא ורחמו יעשה שלום עלינו ועל כל עמו ישראל ואמרו אמן. poems, first of all in, uh, in the original language and then in English translation. This one is uh, by um, an Iraqi poet, a non-Jewish poet, Jabar Jamal Adin. Um, I'd like to highlight a few names in this uh, poem. He refers to the Kifl, uh, Kifli. Kifl is a, a town in Iraq where uh, traditionally and there is the, the grave of um, Ezekiel the prophet. And Dhokifli is a name given to um, that personality in Iraq. He has also, uh, as well as the Jews, the um, Muslims um, regarded uh, the Ezekiel with uh, great reverence. Um, so he is mentioned in, in both. And there is reference to Jews uh, living, I mean, stretching from China to Yemen. So the fact that they had traveled so large distances. Um, there's reference to um, names like Saul and Rubin, Dar Rubin, the ho houses of Saul and of Rubin, two of the early uh, leaders of the Jewish community, but also names that are common amongst Jews even to this day. There's also reference to um, the families Qazaz and Haqqaq, both of whom lost members of their families during the Farhod. Um, I, uh, these uh, touches highlight at least the, the sense of regret and the sense of um, closeness that um, the poet has for the Jews who no longer live in Iraq. Um, I call on um, Alfred Gabay to read this poem in, uh, he, in Arabic and also and to uh, Carolyn Saul to read the translation. Thank you. Al Farhud, or the Holocaust, Al Sharqi. يا يوم واقعة الفرهود أيسي رأته فيك يا دهرا من الشجن لأنت صفحة تاريخ ملوثة بالهول والعار حتى آخر الزمن مزقت وحدة هذا الشعب منطفات فيك الشموع وغاب السعر في الفنن وقوم ذي الكفل قد رعوا بلا سبب وهم طليعة أهل العدل والسنن من حسقيل كريمات نفوسهم ويحسنون بلا من ولا ثمن إذا تصفحت آثار الشعوب تجد أثارهم من تخوم الصين لليمن س 
نسيان عندي دمع عند نسوتهم ودمع نسوتنا الهتان كالمزن دار لشاؤول قد ضاعت محسنها ودار بين أطلال بالمؤون لولا الفنون ما صاوه من أثق ما شع نور الضحي في الشاطئ الحسن عجبت كيف جموع البغي قد زحفت تذبح ذلك الندي المغروس في الوطن أتباع موسى وأنتم رفهم خنتهم نفوسهم لم ترع يوما ولم تهن إذاكم من به نحل وموجدة تفرعت من مرار إن دخل والأحن ورغم ذلك الأذى ثلاث شامخة تلك الجباه ولم تنبه ولم تعن أن يحترق دار عزرة في محلتنا فناره لم تزل ثلاث تحرخني والحكك في حزن دموعهم ما رأين بثمن بالجلاد والوثن ومثلهم القزاز رقد فجعا يشكون الله ما لاقوه من محن ما ضاع حق لكم مهما ناي زمن ينصفه الخلق من نجد إلى يمن ويا شموئيل ينسخ الوفاة ومن لولا لم تكن أشعاري ولم أكن باقى على العهد بالحنا أرده والهجل فرق بين الجفن والوسن هيات هيات أن أسأو محبكم لأنها مثل فرض خط في السنان O the day of the farhood what grief a lifetime it felt of hurt running deep, a contaminated page wedged in the book of history, sorry, in the book of history of shame, of horror and great misery. The Farhood ripped us apart and our unity was torn. The light of love extinguished where it was born. The people of the Prophet, Vu El Kifli, were terrified. The people of honour and justice were sacrificed. Generosity, a trait of Ezekiel they learnt. They offer with no expectations to return favours earned. Their tracks extend from China to Yemen. Tracks and traces of people in history left behind. I dread their women's cries as I dread our women's tears. They pour like rain and fall like streams. Shaul's abode has lost its beauty and Reuben's home is in ruins. If it weren't for their art and talent, no morning lights would have emerged alongside the beautiful shoreline. I am astonished at the group of cowards, trooping to smash the jewel of the nation, marching to wipe out the dew on carnations. Despite the hardship, the people of Moses never bowed to anyone. Despite the harm inflicted, those proud heads never bowed, never accepted those cowards' damnation. 
The burning flames of Ezra's home in our neighbourhood still burn in my heart, ready for immolation. You, the good people of the family Al-Khazar and Al-Hakak, wipe away the tears of sorrow. Your rights will never vanish, regardless of distance and time. From our heart, you will never vanish. You are the purest form of mankind. From China to Yemen, survivors of injustice, survivors of crime. O oh Samuel, the symbol of faithfulness, without you, my poetry would never have seen the light. You are the song in my head that I repeat over and over again. In longing for you and how we parted, that separation that kept the eyelash away from slumber, for you, I promise, never shall I forget your love. Never shall I forget my love for you. It is my path, deeply inscribed, for me to follow. This poem is called Masa Babel, The Burden of Babel, by Balfour Hakak. Sa et hamasa, hu omer. Sa et hamasa, hazer, hazer, masa babel. Riye hamasa, hazer, hu noher. Masa damim al haneharoth. Masa al hadam baneharoth. Saba pocher yadau, un shimato kasha. Behar shabuot, hu boer. וחג שבועות מתן תורתנו הקדושה. בשנת תפיסה היה המסע. הוא זוכר סבי כי במוסאי שבת, יומיים טרם חג השבועות, באו לו סימנים קשים לרעות. נר הבדלה הזליק בסיל כופנה ברביע. של שמן, ועמד הנר קרוב לקיר, ושלח להבה להאיר, ונתן קסם שחור על הקיר, ענן גדול ברקיע. ואמר אז סבי לבניו העתידים להרך, המבדיל בין אור לחושך, הטוסנו ישקיח. פז בסיוון יום איסרו חג, נאסר החג בן חוש שתיים. בבוקר ראה סבי בקומו משנתו ציפורים שתיים, מתות על גג הבית, ישנים היינו על הגג, הוא אומר, וכל הלילה דמיתי שאני שומע בחלומי זעקות ציפורים, כל הלילה קבעו כל הנרות המאירים. בשנתנו קבעו מפחד הזעקות. בבוקר ראה סבא שהדקל בחצרו נעקר, כמו נפל בסערה, גזעו גוסס. גם קבע וחשך נרו של מאיר בעל הנס. כתוב בני, אומר סבא, כתוב זה השיר, כתוב כי קבע גם רבי מאיר, כי ניתז היין, אז לוהט באורכי הרביע, כי כיסה היין חשכה כל הרקיע, ויחשך היום עלינו. ויחשך פרם עת, ויחשך היום כעיני המת. The burden of Babel. Carry this burden, the burden of Babel, he says. Carry the burden. And behold, this burden is glowing blood. Burdens on the rivers, the burden of the blood in the rivers. 
Grandfather twitches his hands. His breathing is hard. In the festival of Shabuot, he burns. In the festival of Shabuot, the festival of our holy Torah in the year 5761, 1941, was the burden. And my grandfather remembers on Mose al Shabbat, two days before Shabuot, he saw portents in the Habdallah candle he lit, a cotton cord in a goblet of oil. And the candle was near the wall and <coughs> threw off a flame of light and gave a black stain onto the wall. A large cloud in the heaven. And my grandfather told his sons it foretells of death. May he who separates between light and darkness forgive us our sins. On the 7th of Sivan, the day of Isru Hag, the festival was chained up. In the morning, upon awaking, my grandfather saw two birds dead on the roof. We were asleep on the roof, he says, and every night I thought I heard in my dream cries of the birds. The whole night, all the candles were extinguished. In our sleep from fear, the cries were extinguished. In the morning, grandfather saw the palm tree in his yard uprooted as though it fell in the storm, its trunk dying. So the light of Meir Baal Hel Ness darkened and extinguished. Write, my son, my grandfather says. Write this poem. Write that Rabbi Meir was also extinguished. <coughs> As the wine scattered burning in the goblet, as the wine darkened on us, darkened before its time, the day darkened like the eyes of the dead. I now call upon Dane Stern from the Board of Deputies to broaden the scope of our evening to talk now about uh, Jews from other Arab lands and Iran. Thank you. In this week's Pasha, Baha we read about the Israelites leaving Mount Sinai on the arduous journey towards the land of Israel, leaving one part of the Middle East towards the homeland of their own, towards freedom in a land of plenty. The journey was arduous. The Israelites even cried before the Lord, Lama Zeyatsano Mimitrayan, why did we ever leave Egypt and long to return to the land that they had only recently exited? Following the Far Hood, there were some Jews who, who had left in Iraq and it did indeed return to the land that they too had only recently exited, believing that Iraq was now safe for them until persecution led them to flee again in 1950 and 51. From the middle of the 20th century, Jewish life was threatened throughout the Middle East. The second exodus of Jews from Egypt is not commemorated in annual seders and Passover rituals. The 1940s, 75,000 Jews lived in Egypt. Today, it is estimated that only 10 remain. Egypt was home to the Cairo Geniza and the Ben Ezra Synagogue, the largest and most diverse collection of medieval manuscripts anywhere in the entire world. It's also home to Al-Azhar University, Sunni Islam's most prestigious university, founded in the 10th century by Yaqub ibn Kilis, a Jew from Baghdad. Anti-Jewish riots in 1945, bombings of Jewish institutions in Cairo a few years later, and in 56, the taking of hostages, mass arrests, and forced deportations of tens of thousands of Jews amidst the Suez Crisis, 
led Egypt's once vibrant Jewish community to now literally number no more than a single minyan. In the year 390, centuries before the Muslim conquest, Yemen's king, Abu Qarab Assad, converted to Judaism. And Yemen was incredibly under Jewish rule for approximately 100 years, with the majority of its population converts to Judaism. In the 1940s, Yemen had 63,000 Jews. Today, it has just 50 individuals. A riot in British-controlled Aden in 1947 killed 82 Jews. Two years later, Operation Magic Carpet flew almost all of Yemen's Jews to Israel. Pogroms like those in Iraq, with Fahul, and in Yemen also took place in Syria. In 1947, riots in Aleppo destroyed 18 synagogues, burned the Jewish quarter, and killed 75 Jews. Recently, with the threat of ISIS nearby, as would have been the case for any Jews who remained in Iraq, the last of the Jews in Aleppo, one of the world's oldest Jewish communities, left in October 2015. In the 1940s, Syria had 30,000 Jews. Today, it has only 18. Not 18,000, 18. Attacks occurred throughout North Africa and Arab countries too. The pogrom in Libya in 1945 killed 130 Jews, displaced thousands and destroyed synagogues. In the 1940s, Libya had 38,000 Jews. The very last Jew in Libya died in 2002. The 1940s, Tunisia had 105,000 Jews. Today it has just 1,000. In Morocco, riots and massacres occurred in Casablanca, Ujda and Gerada. 1961, when a Moroccan cinema screened a dramatised version of Mein Kampf, the audience applauded when an actor in the film exclaimed, we must exterminate the Jews. In the 1940s, Morocco had 265,000 Jews. Today, it has approximately 2,500. Morocco is the Arab country where the most Jews remain. The most, yet 99% of its Jewish community has gone. Today, there are zero Jews remaining in Libya, zero remaining in Sudan, zero remaining in Algeria. There are estimated to be only about five Jews remaining in Iraq. Iran has been more tolerant than the Arab world, slightly. The Jews are a protected minority with the apparent freedom to practice their religion, but there are restrictions on their daily lives following the 1979 Islamic Revolution. Throughout the Arab world, Jewish land that was confiscated was approximately five times the size of the State of Israel. The Arab world once had 800,000 Jews, today only about 4,000 remain. It means that the Jewish population in Arab countries has shrunk by 99.5%. Think about it this way. There are about 200 of you in the room tonight. If every one of you represented a Jew living in the Arab world in the 1940s, only one of you would still be remaining today. Very few people know about this, both outside and even within the Jewish community. It's a textbook example of ethnic cleansing, Yet, the story of this ethnic cleansing appears in almost no textbooks. I'll speak now about the New South Wales Jewish Board of Deputies campaign to recognise the plight of Jews from Arab countries in Iraq. It has four pillars, education, events, commemoration and testimonies. First on education. The Board is working to get this textbook example of ethnic cleansing into textbooks, literally. We plan to work with the Department of Education to get the modern history course on the Middle East conflict to finally include the story of, of Jewish communities like yours. We're currently working with the Jewish day schools to teach this in the Jewish history uh, courses. We've compiled USBs with educational resources that we give out to any teachers who are interested, including the 50-minute film The Forgotten Refugees, an excellent film that shares first-hand testimonies from Jews forced out of Iraq, Egypt and elsewhere. As for events, we're airing the, the Forgotten Refugees as widely as possible. The Board of Deputies is currently lobbying SBS to air the film on TV because we believe it's part of their mandate to show multicultural programming. We've organised several synagogues to screen the film to its congregants. Recently, North Shore of Chabad showed the Forgotten Refugees to 80 congregants and non-Jewish neighbours, including heads of Christian and Ahmadiyya Muslim organisations. An article about the film even appeared recently in the Australian Muslim Times and the Weekend Australian had an article about Rashaline Bada, who is a local Jew who came from Egypt. At Yom Limud next month, attendees will watch this film, The Forgotten Refugees, and hear first-hand testimonies from local Jews, including Alfred Gabahi, president of the Sephardi Federation of Australian Jewry. We'll be trialling more intimate screenings and personal testimonies at people's homes, beginning with the young adults one in my apartment in a few months. So for commemoration, in 2014, Israel dedicated... November the 30th as a day to recognise the plight of Jews from Arab lands in Iran. 
the local Sephardi community ran a, a commemorative event on that date. But since 2015, the Board of Deputies, along with the Sephardi community, has run events that establish these commemorations as part of the Jewish communal calendar, with up to 400 attendees at each. This includes inviting VIPs like media and politicians. As for testimonials, the Board of Deputies is working closely with the Sydney Jewish Museum to compile the story of Jews from Arab lands in Iran, like many of you here tonight. So far, about 30 people have been interviewed as part of a testimonial project, similar to the survivors of the Shoah films, in a way, uh, which will be added to the museum's archives, compiled into a book, and used in a special temporary exhibition that will open up in the next couple of years. The museum's currently looking for funding for this major exhibition about local Jews from Arab countries in Iran, and we expect that thousands of people will attend it. A new permanent cabinet is already on display with items representing Jews from the Middle East, which will be periodically updated with new objects. I'd like to give special credit to Linda Ben Menashe, the Board of Deputies Community Relations Manager, who's spearheaded many of these great projects. Whilst I myself am of Ashkenazi background, I admire the resilience of the Sephardi community. To quote historian Martin Gilbert, the Jews from Arab lands made new starts in life. Bereft of the financial benefits and international sympathy of refugee status, either for them or for their descendants. I also believe it's important that the narrative about Middle Eastern, uh, Middle Eastern refugees remains balanced. So to conclude, the, Israeli, the Israelites in this week's Parsha left the place where they received the greatest Jewish text, the Torah, Mount Sinai. Your community was forced to leave the place that Jews compiled another great Jewish text, the Babylonian Talmud. Iraq was the cradle of civilization between the Tigris and the Euphrates, home to the Mesopotamian, Babylonian, Assyrian civilizations, where Sumerian cuneiform, the precursor to our system of writing even today, was developed, and where great Jewish prophets were born, lived, and were buried. Yet today, Iraq is not a place where people can live safely. It is a blessing in disguise that your circumstances have led you to Australia, a place where you have the freedoms that the Israelites sought when leaving e Egypt, including the freedom to practice your religion, your Judaism, without persecution. May this soon be a place where the wider community finally hears your stories too. Thank you. Wow! Wow!